In this section, which we discuss transitions, <coughs> uh, we will look uh, separately at um, uh, political, economic, uh, and uh, the political transition, economic transition, the social costs of transition, and at the issue of nationalism. Um, that's what we uh, uh, are doing this week. And uh, it kind of corresponds with your, well, that does actually correspond with the chapters assigned from your textbook. So, uh, let's talk about uh, the political transition. And, uh, as usual, you are asked uh, uh, to use the, this lecture and your textbook as, uh, as complementary sources, but not reciprocally replaceable sources. I will make reference to some of the things that your textbook says, but other things, obviously, will be added to that, just like in any classroom lecture, and other things uh, are not covered in your textbook, right? So this is why you have to, uh, uh, to use them as you would do it in regular class, as complementary sources, not reciprocally, uh, you know, um, replaceable. Um, so the let's let's talk today about the political uh, aspects of the transition. But first, let's let's just understand uh, what is going on uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. After 1989, December 1989, the Romanian Revolution is kind of the cutting point, right? and uh, then 1990. Right? What are these countries uh, looking at? The point is to understand the staggering dimension of what is going on. Right? At that point, right, uh, the communist regimes have been removed through, through you know, the, through, through the efforts basically of the people themselves. But then, what next, right? Well, immediately it became very clear, like, the moment, right, the moment they gave up power, they were removed from power, it was clear that the direction was democracy, right? It was clear that the direction was democracy and market, and your book mentions it several times, that there were these three dimensions, that even in the first elections, uh, the so-called opposition parties, right, the, those who used to be the opposition to the communists, um, used as a slogan, right, three things, right? Uh, democracy, the market and return to Europe. Right? So these are the three things. You mean that that for them were, were uh, for these countries they represented the same goal. That's the interest, that's the interesting and important part that you you have to understand. That the revolutions of 1989 happened with this gigantic you know uh, hope, which is this, this this sort of an image in mind that once we remove these damn communists from power. Right? Because in most of these countries, as you notice, this, this has been experienced as an act, as, as a sort of an unf one of those unfortunate acts of action, accidents of history that Kundra talked about, you know, which these countries have had to endure so many times. The Ottomans, now the communists, and now this and now that. Right? And in most of these countries, they have these four, these the communist regimes have been imposed. Right again, you know, you're surviving things that history throws at you. So the idea was, once we remove this, we get back to normality. And that was, the, that was the important thing. This is why these regimes did not last. Many other reasons contributed in factors, but the, one of the essential things was they never had roots. They were always perceived by a majority, and especially in Central Europe, more than, uh, especially in Central Europe, as, an, as, as abnormal. Right? This is what Kundar is pointing out there. Kundar is pointing out how the whole thing was perceived as something unfitting, undignified, unworthy of human beings. Hence, you know, building communism with a human face that failed, it was not possible to make it human, to make it bearable. Life is not, this is not how we live life. Perhaps other societies which like, which like authoritarianism, which like to, to be told what to do, perhaps they like it. But not us. Right? This has been, you know, and this is something that has to do with political culture. And of course, there are differences. And the differences we have talked about the cultural spheres, which kind of uh, uh, between which the, this region has 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 found, found itself throughout history. The fact that East and West meet here, right? Well, that also will shape will will, will shape uh, um, will will reflect in these transitions and in how communism worked in these countries, but also in these transitions. But the point is here that the idea was that once we remove these guys, we're going to be 
just like the rest of Europe as we should be. This is why democracy, market, economy and uh, return to Europe were one thing. There was no qualm, there was no question, there was no discussion about this in principle. Okay. But then it will be discovered very soon that removing the communists and say implementing the reforms necessary for political uh, transition, for moving from a one-party system to multi-party system, from non-democratic to democratic, Communism being essentially undemocratic because it proposes, you know, the one party. Right? That's, that's the idea, right? One party leads and leads you to perfect equality and heaven on earth, right? That's the, that's the, that's the essence of the utopia described uh, in, by Marx, right? Um, uh, and implemented by these communist parties under other influences as well. But the point is. Uh, uh, that was a one-party system, as we talked about, right? And in 1956 in Hungary, they attempted to immediately switch to multi-party, you know, it was crushed. So we do that. And that's easy, right? Right. You pass laws, you change the laws, you allow more many parties, whatever. But does that, does the, does multi-party democracy bring prosperity? Bring prosperity. Okay, well, let's just change also the economic system. Well, that's, that's a whole different story, right? And does that change of the economic system, and first of all, how? Then, second, the, when you change it, does that bring prosperity? Because that's the idea. The idea is we will be free, prosperous, and back in Europe where we should be. Remember this, back to Europe, right? Well, these things don't necessarily go hand in hand. You can have a multi-party system and not a working economy. What does it mean privatization? Does it mean everybody lives better? What does it mean market economy? Right? So all of this, and notice that, uh, you know, when, when, when these changes happen, which nobody predicted, nobody predicted, in Western Europe, all the specialists, quote unquote, nobody predicted. They were all caught by surprise, as it usually happens. Uh, then there is this Blank slate, because nobody has done exactly what these, these countries are supposed to do. Nobody has done a transition from communism to democracy in history before. Nobody. So how do you do it? How, how do you, how do you, what are, the, what are the rules? There are no rules, there's no rule book. You have to, you have to make it up, you have to, to discover it as you go along. So, furthermore, then, the economic transition that they're supposed to make from a state-run economy where there's no private property to reinventing, not reinventing, what, you do give it back to whom, how, I mean, all of this, there's no, there's no manual, there's no textbook for it. And, and they're supposed to do, because they want to do it, you know, they want to have it overnight, and they're supposed to do it in a few years, we are only 25 years later, that's nothing historical. But they did this in about four, five, six years, basically. Which is staggering. And the consequences were also staggering. As your book mentions, the social cost, we'll talk about that, right? The social cost of these of these changes, they people experienced harsh, harder, uh, uh, worst hardship, worst economic hardship. Then during the Great Depression, 1930s, in these years. And yet they kept and remained on the path of democracy. In the 1930s, remember. The depression led to the downfall of many regimes, including Germany. And Hitler came to power and so on. The very recent economic crisis, which incomparable, right, in the United States, 2008, gave rise to two populist movements, Occupy Movement and the Tea Party, which are basically both the same type of, is the same reaction expressed differently, to crisis, to economic crisis. And it was incomparable, you know, compared to the Great Depression. I mean, you can't even put it in the same sentence. Because back to our discussion of what is the role of the modern state, right? Uh, you know, in the previous uh, in the video lectures, the rise of the modern state. Remember, the role of the modern state is to essential role of the modern you know state. The government, what is expected to do is to, the most essential thing is to provide security, and security is physical and economic, and obviously biological, you know, health. But if the state fails to do that, if you're starving or insecure. That's, a, that's, that's that it loses any reason to exist. This is the downfall of, of political systems. Economy is right there. 
So that's it, it just, you know, these, these uh, considerations are needed just to give you a sense of the dimensions and of the open field uh, of, of, okay, how do we get... Now, of course, different countries will have actually things to look at. They will have, just like we talked about the establishment of the political and state and political system, they have the past, the pre-communist past, which many people still experienced, you know, were still alive from that generation. We know how a multi-party system works because we have been part of it even if we were young, in our 20s when communism came about. Now we're in our 70s. Right? Or they, and they have the models around them, even in Western Europe. Right? So those are kind of, you know, and they have their own ideas. But there is no work plan. And also we have to take charge the people who were in the early 90s, when they their 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they had no, I mean, they had no experience from before. They had to, to, to make it work. So, also note here, which is worth mentioning, that 1989 is the, let's call it, the death of Eastern Europe. The, of that, what I mean by that is the death of that expression called Eastern Europe, which meant, right, it was used, Western Europe, Eastern Europe. And every, all of these countries that we, we have been calling Central and Eastern Europe, whatever, were around under Eastern Europe, right? Even one of your books is called like that, unfortunately. Because, right, it, they were lumped under that because it was basically a byword for communists, meaning under communist regimes. Now, with the end of that, there's no East and West versus, you know, communist, non communist, right? And, uh, you know, Kundera has been make, had been making this point in his, you know, the tragedy of Central Europe, he said, to make sure. From that, that his, his readers in France at that point, in New York Times, whatever, <coughs> New, York, uh, New York Review of Books, understand that there is no Eastern Europe in that sense, right? But at that point, it's the, the, the end of that, right? Because now, if we want to use the word cent uh, Eastern Europe, it will have to be based on something else. It's the exam no longer, there's no, like, there's no other communist block, right? So we will use Eastern Europe for, for based on other criteria, we'll have to do. And Central Europe based on other criteria, and Western Europe based on other criteria. But that's an interesting point to mention. Okay, so political transitions. Um, political transitions, right, two major aspects here is the state, right, and then the political system. And understand the difference between them, right? Well, statehood itself, right, was affected by the political transition. Well, let's just look here uh, how the states of Central and Eastern Europe looked, and this is in your document on. Canvas, Central Eastern Europe after 1989 maps. This is how it looked in 1990. By the way, USSR was still around. There's Yugoslavia, there's Czechoslovakia, right? Now, obviously, this will change radically very soon, very soon, right? In the 90s. So, what we notice first is that politically, right, states will also be affected. And some of them will remain the same with the borders from 1918, this is why it was important to understand how they were set up then with the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and some of them will be further, suffer further fragmentation which you just studied when you, uh, by looking, watching and studying that uh, documentary on Yugoslavia but we also talked about Czechoslovakia, right? So that's an interesting thing because um, you know, you can't really have democracy, can you? Uh, or, or a functioning political system if you don't have statehood so you will see the case then where, where this issue of statehood is, is debated, of, of establishing the very frame within which politics works. So what is, okay, we set up institutions in certain ways to be democratic. In order to set up these institutions, you need to have a clearly defined sphere of sovereignty, sphere where those institutions have power, right? And that is the state, right? The state is being a set of institutions in sovereign, with sovereign power over territory and membership. So, this is the first thing, define the plain ground in order to then talk about what kind of institutions I have in the plain ground. If this is debated, if, if this is in danger, if this is threatened, if this is, uh, you know, uh, a subject of conflict, there's no time to set up democratic or undemocratic and whatever. This is why you will see it, uh, some of these countries will be delayed in their, democratiz in their democratization because the question was, the question before, 
the democratization, and is the question of statehood, of defining nations and states. And remember, all of this has happened in the Western Europe and the rest of Europe, and in parts of Central Eastern Europe, in the 19th century up to World War I. This is why they could then build a stable uh, 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 democracy. The same in the United States, right? During the Civil War there was no democracy. When that is in danger, democracy ceases. This is when, if you remember, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. Right? So, that has to give you a sense, and that has to also give you the sense of how important it was that the Czechoslovakia, that they were so determined not to lose the track, not to lose the path, and watching what was going on in Yugoslavia, they decided on the other divorce. Okay, so that's very important. So statehood, establishing statehood, keeping, either remaining the same or establishing new states, would be a big uh, deal. Okay. Then the, the next change is to uh, change the uh, political system, right? So first defining the state, then political system. And change the political system usually happens through passing a constitution. What is a constitution? A constitution is the document or documents that, is, uh, that um, establishes the parameters of the state and of the political system, right? It's that basic document of a state and of a political system that establishes the parameters of the state and of the political system that lists the main institutions of the political system, assigns them their powers, defines the relationship between the different political systems, and defines the relationship between people and the institutions of the political system. So that's what the constitution does. Defines the state and defines the political system by telling you what institutions are, what are their power, what is the relationship between them, and what is the relationship between people and the institutions. That's a constitution, right? Now, clearly that when you re-establish a political system, like France uh, today has the, is, uh, the regime is called the Fifth Republic, right? And that tells you that there needed to be a separate constitution passed at the beginning of this system to establish a different system. So that's what they will ha all have to do as well, our countries here. And when we do the country case studies in the next, next section, we will look at each constitution in part of the countries on which we focus. But that's one thing that will be a challenge, uh, because the question will be who writes the constitution when, based on what, what are the influences, because those are the rules of the game. Just like in the US, you had the Articles of the Confederation first, which was the constitution, which had to fail in order for it to be then written a second constitution. So the constitution actually we call the constitution, is actually the second constitution, and the US is actually the second republic, because first there was a different political system. Okay, um, and what is the goal of this new political system? What are the essential things? Is to move from a one-party system to a multi-party uh, system, right? Well, here's the other thing then. Multi-party system. What does it mean, multi-party system? Right? What, you know, what are parties, right? Parties are, and again, you check the, the, the textbooks, uh, scan chap textbook chapters that are posted on Canvas, because there is a discussion of the different types of party systems. All well, those are terms that we need to be able to use. Um, this is why they're posted there, so that I can use them and you can understand what I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, party systems have to do with, um, you know, how many parties are in a system uh, and, and uh, uh, so on. In this case, what is going on, right? What, how many parties can there be? Well, let's remember, or let's think about what is a party, and why, are, why do parties exist? That's an important question to ask, because parties don't have to exist, right? They don't always exist, they form. And they form because in our, in the, what we have today in the modern democracies is a system called representative democracy. And in a system called representative democracy, the key idea is of representation, meaning that the people, it's called democracy, but it's not democracy. The people don't govern themselves. The idea is that the people send representatives to govern them. And because they're the representatives of the people and they govern them, that's why it's called democracy. It's sort of a mediated government, right? The people don't govern themselves. You know, government by the people, of the people, whatever, says Lincoln, false, right? Because it's actually government by the people's representatives, right? Well, parties emerge because uh, they help channel and coordinate and coalesce 
the will, uh, the different opinions in the population, and they also help coordinate the action in government. Okay? So when you need to win elections, you need to have to win it throughout the country. This is where you need to have one organization that makes sure that you win everywhere so that you get then the majority in the legislature and you can govern. Furthermore, when you are in the legislature, let's say there are two houses and there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an executive, let's say it's Poland, so you have a semi-presidential system of some sorts. Well, because the president is separately elected, in order to govern, right, in order to take power, you need to have the majority here, here, and here. And this is why parties exist, because parties coalesce the action of various elected representatives. So imagine if you have 400 people here, each with their own ideas. They do have their ideas anyhow. Parties make sense of these 400 people elected here by putting them in sort of clubs, right? Which are supposed to follow the same program. And you have democracy because you have several clubs competing with each other and you can choose between them and so on. That's the idea. And because you put them into clubs, you have the same party here, same party here, same party here. That means that these different institutions work towards the same goals. Because what are parties? Parties are groups of people united by the same goals, pursuing the same goals, who's, uh, who want to take political power. Okay? So groups of people who have the same ideas or goals about society, and who want to take political power. They want to take political power not because there are some evil, that's, uh, you know, whatever, uh, gnomes who want to hang on to power. They want to take political power because political power in the democracy is the, the place, right? where you can make the rules for a society, where you can pass laws, where you can govern. And these ideas that they have are ideas about how to live together. Right? So we vote in some people, some representatives, to do what? To make good rules for our lives together, which is our called laws. Well, good or not good, whatever rules we think. Right? And the different parties compete to shape and to channel those different you know, uh, types of ideas about how to live together. But here's the problem. Um, at, the, at this moment, at the, this time, point in time, in 1989, 1990, what parties exist? Well, obviously none. Right? There are no parties, really. There was only one party, the Communist Party, which was not democratic, nobody elected them, right? They were, you know, top-down, you know, the people who had the power, basically, right? They're removed, who replaces them? Right? And that, that was a key thing, and that will explain why the democratization process, the transitions will happen differently in different uh, countries. So let's uh, just think about where will these parties come from? And we're going to look at uh, each different case studies. But where will these parties come from? Right? Where do you come up with parties? Right? So the first source of parties, meaning who are the organized groups that can participate, you know, after you have 1989, communist, uh, you know, regime is removed, who's going to run an election? How do you find, how do you make parties happen? Well, the two major political parties will be, uh, one, the opposition, right, in, for, in certain countries that we talked about, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, you have an organized opposition. And they will be one political force, they will be one party. Right? And opposite to them will be the reformed communists, meaning those who said, okay, let's move towards democratization. Those who were their part, the discussion partners in the round table talks. The first two types of parties will be opposition versus former communists. And of course, in these three countries, then the first ones who will win the first election will be the opposition. Opposition meaning those who oppose communism, and everybody will want them in power. Right? But these are only two. Now, as we talked about briefly, these opposition forces will break down, fall apart very quickly because that's just one idea that unites them. Right? And remember that what our parties are groups uh, united by the same ideas and goals about living together, about society. Right? Well, these groups were opposition were united just by the one thing, one common enemy, the communist regime. So. Once they get in power, they realize that actually they have different ideas about how to go forward. Right? And that's what happens in Poland, in the Czech Republic, and even partially in Hungary. Hungary is a little bit different because in Hungary you had pretty, pretty much parties even before the, the 
the end of communism, like in the last one year, they already formed, so, and they were different, as we talked about, right? And they have already uh, negotiated between themselves. So you had kind of more, you know, prepared. But even those parties would fall apart, okay? Even those. But still, you had some, okay? Uh, so, first, opposition and communists, right? Or for reform communists. Then, what other parties? Who else will form parties, right? You will have, in all, most, many of these countries, you will have parties from uh, returning from the interwar period, right? Communism was this break in development, this break historical dark night, uh, but which was preceded in all of the, most of these countries by a multi party, uh, you know, regimes that had multi party systems. In Romania, you had many parties in between the wars, Hungary, and so on, right, until communists eliminated them, right? Uh, so, in 1989, you, what you will see in many of these countries is the return of the interwar parties, right? Including, you know, with people who have experienced them and have been part of them. In none of these countries they, will they be very uh, efficient, very successful, long term. They will be, have some impact in the first 10 years, but not later. Uh, for various reasons, which we, we might talk about. Then, third source of forming parties, right? right? Because you have to, when you come up with these ideas, will be to take up Western models, right? So you will have parties formed, you know, because where do you get your ideas from, right? How do you shape these ideas? This is the issue of political culture, right? Under communism, the struggle was an authoritarian totalitarian system versus civil society versus those who wanted a more human, decent, normal life. Freedom, freedoms, liberties, dignity, uh, freedom of speech, of thought, thought and so on. Right? That, those are the two things. Right? So that's also what results in the first election. But then you need you know, to ask yourself, okay, but what next? Which, which way do we go? And for that, the Western political parties give you models. Because they have been functioning for about 45 years, right, in freedom. Yeah? So you have models. You have social democracy, you have Christian democracy, you have this, you have that, you have green parties, you have this, right? And all of these represent tried, true and tried models, Western models, that some of these parties in, from, from Central Eastern Europe will either form new... You know, they will even either uh, have new parties that will form based on those models, or certain existing parties will pick up those models and shape themselves after them. Right? Let me give an example, right? The typical example in most of these countries will be the reformed communists who will lose the first election. In many of these countries, they will, well, in these countries, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland, communists, the reformed communists, will, those who agreed to moving towards democracy, will lose the first election. These were younger guys, so the old echelon, the old communists were removed. And, but they will come back in the second election, actually. So Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, in the second election, uh, when the people will be disappointed that the opposition groups who won the first election, 1990 usually, didn't proceed to make miracles and suddenly have prosperity, there will be a swing back, a pendulum swing, and in most of these countries, the reformed communists will win, but it won't be the communists who will win. Because nobody would vote for communists, they're not idiots. Uh, excuse my French. Uh, it will be social democratic parties. And this, so in many of these countries, there will be a progress, there will be a turnaround of people who, from second, maybe second national who used to be, you know, the reformed, you know, more younger, you know, those who actually participated in reform, in this transformation in 1989 in some of these countries, whatever, they will transform themselves into social democratic parties on the Western model, playing by the rules, becoming democratic, accepting multi party, wanting to make market reforms, all these things. Yeah? And they will win the election in, in, in several of these, of these countries. And that will be an example of existing parties who, shaped by the communist anti communist dichotomy, transforming themselves based on Western models. And other opposition parties, for example, from Hungary, will pick up Western European models, 
for example, in Hungary, they, they will look at Germany for models and they will become, you know, Christian democratic parties and so on. Okay. So, Western political identities. What's another source of making parties, right? This, this goes back to political, over and over again, we will come back to the idea of political culture. Right? Uh, meaning, what is the what is the thinking about politics in a given society? Right? And in that sense, we have to understand now, really, after you've learned about communism, which because otherwise it don't, doesn't make sense, right? These countries are countries. You have to understand that the, 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 the challenge, again, of establishing a working democracy, because who knows how this works? I mean, who has the who has the, the tools, the skills to, to function in a liberal uh, democracy? They had them because this is what made them oppose the communist regime, because it was felt as abnormal, right? But there are additional things that, you know, uh, uh, need to be uh, acquired, uh, sets of ideas, right? Uh, again, in communism it was clear, it was, you were either for or against the, the regime, right? That was it, right? But then, you, it becomes more complex, it's not a, you know, we're, okay, democracy is here, what do we do next? Which way do we go? What are the values? What are the, the subjects? What are the items? Which path? All of these which were not a subject because you just simply wasn't the subject during communism, the subject was survive and oppose, or whatever, right? Or play along, right? And be an elite, nomenclatura, you know, rule the, 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 the country, and whatever. So, now, all of this has to be developed, and that's the political culture. And here's where deeper layers come to the fore, right? Deeper layers come to the fore, because you will have countries, right? Again, the Central Europe, we talked about Poland, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, which can harken back to a certain civic culture that they have, a certain, you know, set of values, and remember, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that also will apply in the western part of Romania, it will also apply in the northern part of Serbia, it will also apply to Slovenia and partially Croatia, right? Slovenia and partially Croatia, because all of these will harken back, you know, these people have, some of them have experienced the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, that bourgeois society, that, that, that sort of civilization, right? And it goes to the deeper layers, right? Again, deeper layers, that where you will see that differences between the parts of this area which used to be either part of the Ottoman Empire or under Ottoman influence or later under Russian sort of an influence but although not really cultural but most political and so on, right? Uh, and these, remember, were the parts that leaned more eastward, you know, many of them, all of these are Orthodox countries there's nothing wrong with that but it's a specific type, the Byzantine model, in which the ruler is more authoritarian, more he's the boss of it all, right? Versus the Western model, which developed, you know, uh, the, you know, the Catholic, Protestant, you know, in which, uh, um, in where, you know, it's not absolutist, you know, the ruler is not the boss of them all, and so on. Uh, these are deeper layers that go back centuries. This is what, you know, which you, which we have examined for a purpose. To understand, right, that there, these civic, these political cultures go farther back, and they shape the way in which politics happens. Because you can set up the same, you know, Romania has semi-presidential, Poland has semi-presidential, and yet it works differently. Uh, you know, uh, Hungary has a, a, a parliamentary, and uh, you know, I don't know, uh, whichever else can have a parliamentary system, right? For Bulgaria or what, right? Whatever. And it's going to work differently. Why? Right? So this is the issue of, of, of uh, political culture. We see political culture has these deeper layers, but also has these more immediate layers. And this is why the question of political parties. Political parties are groups united by the same ideas. When can those ideas be formed? Right? They will form gradually. So, one of the other things that you will see uh, happening throughout uh, this, this area are parties that are not formed necessarily around specific ideas. And notice, well, you know, parenthesis here, that these ideas are not the same as the common ideas about politics in the United States. Or, you know, because what's in France is not the same as what's in Germany, it's not the same as what's in the Czech Republic, not the same as what is in Hungary. The concerns are different. They're desires about politics are different, their views about what's important and what not, the debates are completely different, 
So whatever seems to be here for, you know, whatever, in today, elections, campaigns, oh, this is the deal, this is the issue. No, they're not the issues there. Because it's part of a different political culture. And again, that's one of the benefits of studying comparative politics. Understand that these are not absolutes, but are shaped by a specific society and political culture. So, one of the things that will happen here is that many parties will form around, less around ideology, because in order to have uh, clear ideologies, you have to have masses of people indoctrinated that this is an important, I mean soft ideologies, right? Meaning a set of ideas, right? not hard ideologies. So, in order to have such political ideologies more widespread in the people, they need to be enculturated into them. It's by hearing it on TV over and over again that this is, these are the only choices, this is the issue and these are the choices, that you acquire those ideas. Right? This is why you think, oh, it can only be Republican or Democrat, because these are the two things that exist in the world. Of course not. But you have been acculturated into a certain set of thinking that, oh, there's only two groups, or two sets of ideas. Right? That's part of acculturation. Well, at this point, there is no such acculturation. There is no such... There isn't time to build this up. Right? So, often you will have parties organized not around ideologies, but around... Because ideologies don't attract... will not attract enough people, because they have not been told to the people that, oh, this, these, these are the only two choices you have. Or five, or whatever. So people will be not... You can tell them, oh, you have to, you know, whatever. Free market and whatever, and like, whatever, I don't care. But there will be other things that will attract their vote. Because remember, parties are formed in order to get the vote, and in order to get the vote, they have to convince the people that what they stand for is what they want. Well, if you can't convince them with ideas, you can convince them with, with personalities. So in, some of many, <laughs> in many cases, or some of these cases, parties will be formed around personalities. It's this guy, it's Lech Balesa, it's Václav Havel. It's Jimmy, it's Bobby, it's Billy, it's whatever it is, right? He's the guy I'm voting for, and the party, because it's his party. Okay. That's an important aspect, okay? Or parties will be formed around interest, and especially in those countries of the region which will, where democratization will be slower, you will notice that parties will be formed by elites who were there, who got into politics at the right time, at the right place, had the skills, and they basically will use politics to have a hold on power and on benefits. And these will be the countries like Bulgaria, like Romania, where democratization will be slower. Okay. Uh, then, we get to one of the aspects that your book spends some time on, but again, I'm going to have a different take. Uh, and obviously, so it's different, you know already. But your book mentions it, right? The fact that there are regional differences in how democratization happens. And your book talks about two stages, whatever, they're fine with me. But, so, let me <coughs> synthesize the regions and some of the causes. So, you have 1989 communism, uh, communist regimes are important. And then you have to move again to what? Uh, political pluralism, democracy, uh, market economy of some sort, right? Not, not of the one we have here, by the way, a little bit different, but market. And then, uh, return to Europe, meaning international relations, that means being part of European Union and NATO, basically. That's what it meant. And all of these immediately, or most of these immediately, just said, yeah, we want in next day, basically. So, but on this, if this is the goal, how, how, different, how the different countries will pro progress towards that goal, will kind of divide them into three major groups. So what are these three groups? The three major groups, at least until... I'm going to say, books, well, books that talks about 1989-1996, I'm going to say 1989-2000, basically being one chunk and 2000, from 2000 to now being the second stage. So in that first 10 years, the first decade, you will have basically these two groups, Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary, is basically one group, right, of those that we study, and Slovenia. Because it will break away quickly from Yugoslavia with little to no war. So that's very important. It will be a clean break. Remember, it will be able to define its state quickly. Right? Unlike Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo. So mostly these three. Uh, and to each
which we can add in parentheses, maybe a little bit Croatia, maybe a little bit Slovakia, but Croatia and Slovakia not in the 90s, mostly later. But notice what's common about these countries here. Right? These are the countries that we have mentioned to be of Central Europe. These are also the countries that, um, that have been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These are also the countries that would, uh, used to be part of the sort of Western culture, of sort of, you know, Western Christianity, Catholic or Protestant, right? It's all this chain here. And, and I'm going to add here also the western part of Romania and the northern part of the corner of Serbia, which still were part of the same cultural cleavage, cultural divide. Because even within Romania, which will fall in a different category, the west will develop a little bit differently, or at least will behave differently. But let's not go for that far. So what's common to these, and truly, these Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary especially, their transition went so, you know, fast, immediately, stable, multi-party, and so on. So they established free and fair elections, rule of law, civil liberties and political rights, limited and accountable government, what are these four things that I just listed? Remember, these are the definition of a liberal democracy, as we find it in the document in our campus. Now, we're going to use those terms, which is why I put them there. We're going to use liberal and illiberal. Illiberal, right? Well, I'm going to use them we have to know what they mean. Okay? Now, the question is, why did this democratization go so fast, so stable, and so on? Why here and not elsewhere? We're going to come back to this, but first let's talk about what are the two other categories. So the one category is those who, where democratization will go very fast, very stable, very you know, uh, successful, the champions of democracy. The then we'll have a group uh, that I will classify uh, your, your book, I think, calls them hybrid and whatever, that's confusing. I would classify them as illiberal democracies. Illiberal, right? Look, look up the definition, right? It's, not, it's like almost liberal, but not quite. Well, look at the definition. And those would be Romania and Bulgaria. Where democratization will be slower, more delayed, so all those reforms, political, economic, and, and re-entry to Europe, will proceed. But they will be like in the second carriage. They will be behind, like five steps behind, significantly behind them, versus these. Yeah? Why? And it's an interesting question. Because all of them remove the communist regimes at the same moment. And this is why we deal, you know, as I said in the syllabus, this is why this region is so tremendously rich in, from the perspective of political science. Because there's, these are key aspects uh, of political science that we deal about today. And this is a laboratory where we can study how it happened. We talk about, you know, think Iraq, think the Arab Spring, how to move from that to democracy. Right? Well, here's the laboratory to see uh, how these happen. And then there's a third group. So the second group would be Romania, Bulgaria, and I also include Slovakia in the 90s for specific reasons. Right? Um, and then the third group, and obviously the third group will be the countries of former Yugoslavia, perhaps excluding Slovenia. Right? And these will be very different because in the 90s they will be, will be busy not moving towards democracy and uh, market economy and back to Europe, but with what? Carving out statehood. Right? War. Right? The book has a nice quote on State makes war, uh, wars, wars make states, states make wars. Uh, indeed, and before, you know, when the very existence of the entity is a threat, democracy takes a second seat, takes, a, takes the back seat. So, when na this is what, nationalism, right? Fighting for the nation, for its survival in order to have its state, that takes precedence over freedom, democracy, and so on. Why should it be? Right? That's a whole different question. Does it make sense? Right? But you, you saw the documentary. But that's what happens here. It's, it's nationalism. Which we'll talk about this week again. But nationalism takes uh, such precedent and the very existence of statehood is in question, literally, right? that all other political forces, all other political ideologies, all other political options are 
submerged onto this. And whether it is the former communists as in Serbia, Milosevic, or it's the opposition, the anti-communists as in Croatia, all of them are nationalists at this point, because they're all fighting for defending the nation. This is in the 2000s, now it changes later. Okay, so let's, let's look at some of the reasons why these differences, right? Well, I already mentioned some, right? The countries of, let's call them Central Europe here, or the Northern Tier, so to speak. Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, let's say Slovenia, in the 90s. What do they have in common that allowed them to be faster? And Slovenia was, the moment it got stable, you've got to remember it, very quickly, no war basically, seven days, whatever. They, they progressed immediately. Slovenia just went ahead. It became just like Austria and before Hungary and the Czech Republic. So it's a small country of 2 million people. Okay, so, but why could they go so fast? Well, let's look at some of the things that they had. They had a peaceful transition in most of these countries, right? A negotiated transition, not a violent revolution. But that's perhaps not even an answer. Perhaps that is actually a... a, a, a um, it's not a cause, it's perhaps an effect of the actual cause, which you mentioned rightly so. And that cause being the fact that the civil society, the creation of a political culture in, a society, in the society, that, that was pluralist, that had different alternatives, alternative, that, that created different ideas, that were not dominated by the communists, this has been going on during communism. And that was what led, as we discussed, to the more gradual transitions and not a violent explosion. That the system has been eroded, ha had been eroded through the construction of a civil society during communism. And that allowed them to transition more readily into a democratic system. Because once you had, were free to compete in elections, you were free, the ideas, the political culture, right, of what should we do, well, we're ready. These people have been thinking about alternatives and what will we do when communism dies, finally, for one or two decades. They have been working together, they have developed the skills of, of, of thinking about things, of preparing, of being ready. Now, obviously you see the difference with, say, Romania, or even Bulgaria, a more oppressive regime. It's not necessarily because the Czechoslovak regime was also oppressive, but you didn't have a civil society here. You see how important it is. I mean, <coughs> the famous book, but it's called um, um, Bowling Alone. Bowling Alone. And Bowling Alone is a book, is a oh, fairly recent book, uh, well, more recent, um, about the decline of civil society in the United States. And it compares the United States' uh, civic and associative life with the Italian civic and associative life. And has the title Bowling Alone. Because the point made there in the book is that a, a political system, a democratic political system, doesn't, cannot last without a rich, vibrant, associative civil society. And, when it, and what happens here? Do we have a dictatorship? This is why we don't have civil society in the US? Of course not. But society has become so atomized. We're all individuals that go to work, go shopping, go home, and it's all these unique individual trajectories, that there isn't an, a rich associative layers to the society that would sustain a healthy democracy. But anyway, that's the argument. But you see, it's applicable anywhere, right? Now, this was absent here for the reasons discussed. Hence also the explosive revolution uh, there. Well, look, at, look, let's look at other differences. What do these countries have in common? What do these countries have in common? Well, we talked about this. These have been part, have been the Western leaning. They have been part of the Western, part, uh, Western, you know, the, the values of, you know, Austro-Hungarian Empire of civic, certain a certain type of active civic life. Remember, middle class societies to a degree, right? Um, benefiting from this urban, you know, uh, uh, civilization. Uh, Technologically, industrially more advanced, unlike Slovakia, which was industrialized during uh, communism, remember, um, and have had the, the you know the, the experience of um, those values that undermine, that underlie, not undermine, 
that are the foundation of Western uh, democracies. Now, these here have been what? Again, Bulgaria, well, what is today Bulgaria, used to be for centuries on the Ottoman Empire, which is a top-down, by no means democratic, obviously, you know, there was no urban culture, these were mostly peasants under the Ottoman Empire, until the middle of the 19th century, right? More Eastern leaning, the Byzantine model, all of these things that we talked about that Kundra actually talks about. But notice that there is a, the, we talked about Transylvania versus the other two provinces, and that differentiation will, will, that clash will be evident in Romanian politics throughout the 90s of how this side will vote and how this side will vote, except for the big urban centers, not by chance. Right? We'll see when we talk about Romania in specific. But you see, this east west fall time, which is not, you know, fate or predeterminism, it doesn't mean that these, these cannot get there, but you see effects, I, I would say, one would say. And again, it has to do with political culture. Um, also, another thing that is interesting is that all of these countries have had uh, the, the, the communist parties didn't just explode and disappear, but there was already an undermining group within the communist parties, the so-called reform communists, who themselves led to the disassembling of the actual communist party, of the communist regime, themselves took the communist regime apart in Hungary in these states. They were of course removed in 1989, but because they had the legitimacy of having actively worked against the communist regime, right, they could come back as social democrats. Not here. In both of these countries, you had oppressive regimes, right? There was no negotiation, there was no reform communists. It was either, you know, the, the regime, the old hardline, or, and the rest, and the rest wasn't organized. So that's also a thing that the transition was, the revolution was an explosion, but when the explosion happened, the regime was removed, there was no one to take the, the front line. And remember who takes the front line in Romania? It's a second-ranking communist who was not really a reformist communist, although, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? But, you know, at least he wasn't part of the hard time, who was not ready to enter democracy. You only guess. And same here. And these communists, the, the, say the, the reform communists, let's call them, or ex-communists is better. Yeah, the ex-communists here and the ex-communists here, they will not let... let uh, 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 they will not uh, leave the, the reins of power, they will not give up the reins of power. They will hold on to it, and they will put brakes to the development. And the opposition will be too weak for the reasons mentioned, that there hasn't been an opposition growing during communism, to be able to replace them and to win the elections in the first elections. They, to, they will have to, take, to, to, to wait for about six, seven, eight years to do that. This is why the author ends the first stage of 1996, because that's the election in Romania which removes the, these ex-communists and Iliescu truly from power. Right? Because by the, time, by the time the opposition became strong enough to be able to be publicly present and, sh and, and persuade the public and inculturate the public about the other available paths and so on. Okay, which is needed in order to win elections. Enough of the public, right? Enough, right? Because you always, they always were there, right? But you have to win majority and so on. Okay, so no organized opposition for about five, six years, and the second national communists or whatever ex communists don't let loose of the reins of power. That's also another reason why these two countries have a very gradual economic reform as well. Because they, these will not be the opposition, they were still, oh no, no, let's keep the state involved, let's keep state property, not pri privatization should be slower, everything is slow. Political, uh, uh, economic, everything, all, the entire transition is slow. Slowly moving further while these are moving fast. But notice that these are all in the same region, so the people here will want a common complaint in Western Romania at least during the 90s, early 90s, was why don't we have a Havel? Why don't we have a Valesa? We need that, not Dan Right? Because they, they are aware of what's going on in the other countries here. Of course, they travel freely by now and so on. And the model is there. 
Okay, um, so the first elections here will be won by the ex-communists, because they're the ones who are organized and ready. And parties are about, as I said, organization. I don't care about your ideals. You have to have the people in, on the ground to campaign and so on. They are the only ones that have the resources, the structure, and the money, as your chapters explain. So they win the first election, but they will fail, of course. So the second election will be won, or the third will be won by the opposition. You see, it's exactly different. In these countries, first, first election, the opposition to the communist wins, then immediately it fails to do all those miraculous things, and it also falls apart. So in the second election you have reformed, but these truly reformed, social democratic, formerly reformed communists, now social democratic, will come into power. Third election, they will also be removed, but anyway, that's a different story. Here you have the opposite. The first election is still won by ex-communists, very gradual transition. It's only the second and third election, 96 in Romania, that the opposition wins. So it's, it's a delayed transition. The revolution was won in 1989, but it was only, power was only taken in 1996 in Romania, in many ways. Of course they will be democratic already, but this is why I call them illiberal democracies. Because a full liberal democracy has to exhibit all those four major criteria I mentioned, and they will lack some. They will lack some. Elections will be free, but there will be some shadiness, okay? Uh, access to media. Free media, but... TV, the national TV stations, which are the ones that everybody watches, right? the state-owned, will be in the control of the power. So, not quite all these, uh, all these things that we have mentioned. That's what makes them illegal. Okay. Um, and notice what I mentioned, that the difference between the urban and the rural area, that the urban areas will vote more westward-leaning. And in fact, the political life in these two countries in the 90s would be the, still dividing between opposition to the ex-communists and the ex-communists in power. Who, again, this was already democratic regimes and everything, the sense of you, they had freedom of speech, freedom of whatever, you know. But the transition was not much slow. Okay, so then we get to this here. Where obviously the main thing, the main thing here is what I mentioned, the fact that they are still, they're in the process of state building. So forget political, uh, you know, democratization, building a democratic political system. State building comes first. And the issue of nationalism is the overwhelming one. And literally, you know, they're under existential threat. It's war. So, every political, uh, any political uh, uh, entity, party, right, group united by the same ideas that needs to get enough support from the population and then be voting get, get in, uh, got, uh, to get into power, they have elections, but the only thing you can tell the people the people are not going to vote for you to say, oh yeah, from now on we want to have more newspapers or whatever. They want to say, what are you going to do so that there is a Croatia? And it's not taken over by Yugoslavia or Serbs. That's the question. So nationalism becomes the only rhetoric of the day. This is why even the opposition groups in, in Serbia, because they were there, and I remember because I was working with them, even the opposition groups in Serbia, um, uh, you know, it's going to be, they're going to be in a very difficult situation. Because you're acting against Milosevic, who is an authoritarian ruler, there's no democracy there. But he says, it's war, and I'm the leader of the nation, I'm saving the nation. I'm the Lincoln of the Serbian, says he. So how do you act against this person who proclaims himself to be the, the holder of the greater interests of the Serbian nation? Same as the historical heroes who fought the Battle of Kosovo and so on. You know, how do you do that? What? Because if you attack him, you attack the nation, don't you? Because it's about the saving of the nation. Same in, uh, same in Croatia with Franjo Tudjman and so on. Okay? They're in a very huge conundrum. So it will take, in Serbia specifically, Milosevic losing war after war after war. You know, nationalist leaders who fail continuously miserably and everybody suffers from it, eventually they lose legitimacy. And that's what happens here. So it will take the year to, up to the year 2000, Serbia's revolution. If all the other revolutions were in 1989, Serbia moved from communism to nationalism, an authoritarian nationalism, not to democracy. And 10 years later, it will have its revolution, that's 2000. And it will be, like in other countries, similar, student-led, youth, workers, and so on, uh, street, and 
not by chance, the civil society from the other countries will inspire, help, guide, and train, and give inspiration and support to these opposition movements from here, because it was exactly what they did in 1989, only that it's happening in 2000. And again, I know because I was 